Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Alex and Otto's Auto Buyer's Guide Weekly. If you want to email in your questions, be sure and send an email to Stefan with that email that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, with that out of the way, let's roll into the news. So, lots of good news today. All, obviously, all very EV related. Uh, BMW, a couple weeks ago, dropped a bunch of information on the i4 and the iX. So, let's start with the iX because everybody's crossover hungry. So, why not? So, the iX is going to have two versions. There's the xDrive 40 and the xDrive 50. It's funny that's, that they're keeping the same name. Yeah, but there's no E at the end, notice? Oh, that's true, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. no E at the end. So the xDrive 40 will get you about 300 horsepower. That's a 70 kilowatt hour battery and 500 horsepower if you go for the xDrive 50. About 300 miles of range they're saying for the for the xDrive 50. I think the funny thing is it seems like BMW is all of a sudden bursting forth with more mainstream styled EVs, but they didn't adopt the 800 volt charging system mm -hmm. that the Volkswagen Audi group is going for and Kia and Hyundai are going for. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it seems to be charging slower. Yeah, and then same thing with the i4. The i4 though is essentially, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's a four series Grand Coupe just electrified. Looks exactly yep. like one. Um, or are we gonna call it a EV3 series? That's true. <laughs> yeah, with a coupe roof line. I have the sneaking suspicion that they called it the i4 because they already have the i3. Otherwise, that would have been the i3. That's that's yes. what I think in my head. Oh, for sure. And yeah, so i4 and i4 and ix are going to be the first two cars to get the new iDrive system. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, there's a bunch of videos on it out on it, and it is fantastic looking. That that the screens are huge. Huge screens, and they're all curved too. <laughs> they're saying about 300 miles EPA for the i4 and. You know, if I guess they're going to have an M, M performance model, so that's probably the one that's going to have 530 miles and 80 kilowatt hour battery. Not that big, surprisingly, but then it's a sedan. And it is interesting that the battery is not the same in the i4 and the iX. So this is at least three different battery packs from, yeah. from BMW here. The 70 kilowatt one in the iX, the 80 kilowatt hour one in the i4, and then the 100 kilowatt hour one back in the iX again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which goes, which, you know, it begs the question, is, is this car aerodynamic? Because we don't know, yeah. We don't know, and what tires is it using? So, so yeah, and be before we leave Germany, let's go ahead and address that whole thing with Volkswagen. And I, I'm wondering though, what is it, what can VW do to actually improve their sales in the US? I'm, I'm honestly always shocked that Volkswagen sales are so poor here, and I've never understood it. Yeah. And they've tried everything that, that reviewers and customers claimed they wanted. They gave us cheap cars. They gave us diesels. They gave us efficient cars. They gave us, uh, you know, discount Audis for a while. They gave us luxury cars. They gave us real wood and lots of leather. Mm -hmm. Nothing they did made anybody buy them. Any time period that you look back in American car buying history, Volkswagen just, they just were never as big as I think they should be based yeah. on their international profile. I mean, there really weren't that many bugs or buses sold back in the iconic area that people like to, you know, mm -hmm. reminisce about. Um, back when Jettas were boxy and practical and didn't seem to have those problems, they, they didn't sell that well then either. Yeah, it's just funny too, because one of the best compact cars you can buy is built by Volkswagen, the Golf. Yeah, the Golf Every is great. Every version of the Golf that I've driven has been, yep. to the point, fantastic. None of them, all of them drove well. They were built well. And mind you, this doesn't even matter where they were built. Hey, look at the Passat and the and the Jetta and the Golf. And, and you know, it was the, oh, well, you know, maybe maybe Americans want something more premium. So we'll give them the, the Jetta and the, uh, the Passat based off of Audi platforms, you know, and and that didn't help them. So then they mm -hmm. went cheaper again, and that didn't help them. And mm -hmm. now they're going electric. I don't know if that's going to help them. Kia, this was yesterday. Yep, this was Kia yesterday. released their brand Kia, new EV. Kia released the EV6. I don't know how I, I don't know how you feel about the name, but the car as a whole, I do love the whole avant-garde look of it. it kind of grew on me over time, actually. I'm not sure about the back end. Yeah, that's the point of contention. What isn't a point of contention, though, is the GT. <laughs> yeah, 577 horsepower. So it'll have more power and be faster 0 to 60 than BMW's new EVs. And it will charge faster. Yeah, it'll charge faster and they're aiming for, I guess, roughly about two, 230 miles for that car. 
looks like range is not going to be quite as as long as Ford's new EV because their WLTP rating is about 100 kilometers less than the longest mm-hmm. range EV6. Um, but you know it'll charge faster. We don't know pricing yet, unfortunately. Yes. He is that's going to be the big. That's going to be. Yeah. That's going to be one of the make or break factors, considering everybody mm-hmm. thinks Kia should offer insane levels of value after all. Other than that, it's it's kind of shocking that they actually pulled off this 570 some odd horsepower GT version. Yet I, yeah, Hyundai Ionic doesn't. Hyundai Ionic Five doesn't get it. It seems like the Ionic is trying for a slightly more luxurious, more I guess mainstream mission, mm-hmm. and the GT or EV6 is trying to be sportier. But mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a 577 horsepower Ionic at some point. For sure, hopefully soon, and then. I think everybody's going to say hallelujah to our next news, and that is Lexus finally committing to electrification. Yes, but it makes me wonder, what do they mean by that with electrified mm-hmm. vehicles? Are we simply talking hybrids, plug-in hybrids, full EVs? I know Toyota has a few EVs in the works, but they haven't really detailed anything. Well, with that out of the way, let's dive into the questions, and it sounds like our first question also has to do with EVs. Oh, totally, because somebody's asking for route planning. You got any tips for that, Alex? You know, charging plans, routes, uh, what's your average That's an interesting speed? Question. You've, done a, you've done a few already with the Mach-E. Yes, yes, I have. So I've, you know, took a deep dive into it. Um, and honestly, none of the route planners really are that accurate, I've discovered. So, um, you know, there are sites like a better route planner that a lot of folks uh, talk up, um, especially Tesla fans. It seems like some of their consumption figures are perhaps a little bit more refined on the Tesla side, but with other EVs, it's not that useful unless you really have a good handle on your true consumption, watt hours per mile. Um, so you're, you're in, I think, better just left to decide yourself, you know, plan your route out using some of the charge apps uh, that show you where the charge stations are. Electrify America is obviously the elephant in the room um, because they are the only nationwide network that has the major interstate highways and U.S. highways completely covered, uh, with the exception for, you know, Montana and Nebraska, basically. Um, so if you want to drive from California to Florida or Washington, D.C. or New York to Washington, that is the network that you will have to use to charge all the way across the country. Um, and then just plan that distance out yourself is what I've discovered. Just you find that next charging station, however far away it is put it in your nav system, drive their charge. That's what I've discovered is probably the easiest thing to do. Now, I will say that um, the car's built-in route planner on the Ford will take you to Electrify America stations. It seems to prefer them. So if I plug in, you know, where I am today in San Jose uh, down to San Diego, which is, what, 600 miles-ish, um, it will stop at Electrify America stations. And that's the one thing that I thought was weird about the ID4 is it does not do that. It does not direct you to the charging stations that Volkswagen owns, which blows <laughs> my mind. Continuing on to the theme of EVs, would you recommend a Bolt, a used Bolt for cold, for cold weather daily driving and you don't have a level two charger? Yeah, this is an interesting question here because yeah. this this person was asking about about ownership in Calgary and Alberta, Canada, uh, driving 40 miles a day. So I did some rough, you know, back of the hand calculations here. And uh, those 40 miles, depending on exactly your terrain and exactly how cold it is, in a bolt, you could be consuming 18 to 20 kilowatt hours. That could be tricky because at a level one charge cord, you're talking, you know, maybe about one kilowatt hour per hour. Uh, being being sucked down into the battery. So 18 to 20 hours to recharge that, that could be problematic. Um, if you have no access to a level two charger and you absolutely can't get one, then a plug-in hybrid might be better for you or uh, an EV with a heat pump might get you closer depending on your exact miles and route. Maybe you could get your consumption down to say 13 to 15 kilowatt hours per day for that commute in cold weather. Things still would be a little bit shaky as as to being able to actually recover that entire day's worth of driving back into the battery. Maybe you could use it during the week and your charge state would gen- would steadily drop down and drop down and drop down, and then you could fully recharge over the weekend. Might not be that convenient, though. Yeah, and if you want uh, if you want an EV with a heat pump, I think you only have two choices at this point if you're going to go used, and that's Nero EV and uh, Ionic, uh, not Ionic, El- Kona Electric. The Kona and uh, the Leaf. Leaf's had a heat pump for a while. Um, The Leaf might lose more range in the cold because 
uh, of the the way that the battery is is uh, done in the leaf essentially. Yeah, oh, don't want to go too far into it. Too. Passively cooled battery pack is the big reason there, or it, especially in cold weather, it's going to be passively chilled, um, so that could be a problem. Um, but it would have a heat pump. Mm -hmm. Rav4 Avenza, 60 mile an hour, 60, 60 miles per hour, roughly rough average speed and commute into highway. Also looking at an Outback and Forester. And also in uh, Canada. So Canada thanks too. to all of our Canadian friends for yeah. calling in. Uh, but since uh, most of you are not in Canada, we're going to be using American units here. So uh, <laughs> more, more, more calculations here. Uh, you know, the RAV4 hybrid will be 40 miles per gallon, and the Venza is going to be pretty close to 40 miles per gallon. We'll just call them both 40. Um, the Forester and the Outback are both going to be 29 mpg, and depending on how much city driving you're doing, expect it to not really get to that EPA rating. Um, however, the RAV4 and Venza are honestly going to be pretty close in a wide variety of different driving situations. Uh, so I looked up your gas prices in Ontario, and uh, you do pay a little bit more than most Americans down here in the U.S. do. Uh, 365 a gallon is what it was uh, averaging last week. Uh, so that means your yearly savings would be 550 American dollars if you opted for a RAV4 or a Venza. I see that you're concerned about fitting into the Venza because you're a taller person. That could be a bit of a problem, and it's going to apply pretty equally to the Venza because basically the Venza is a RAV4 with different styling. So in terms of legroom on the inside and headroom, it's actually a little smaller than the RAV4, even though it's bigger on the outside. The size increase is really just the bumpers and the styling in the Venza. I might suggest that if you want to stick with the Toyota product, you take a look at the next size category up, a Highlander Hybrid. Uh, will give you actually pretty similar fuel economy to the RAV4 if you treat it gently. Or you could wait for the new Sorento plug-in hybrid. It's going to give you more room and all-wheel drive. If you get just the regular Sorento hybrid, it's just front-wheel drive at the moment. So you might want to wait for the Tucson as well, because the Tucson gets about 38 miles per gallon. It's coming pretty soon. That's true. And mm -hmm. uh, will it be all-wheel drive as well? It's all-wheel drive standard. Yeah, yep, which is so there weird. You go. Which is weird because the Hyundai SUVs with hybrid powertrains are all all-wheel drive, mm -hmm. even the plug-in ones. Yep. And I would probably steer away from the, the CRV hybrid. It is available in Canada, but you're not going to be seeing the same kind of fuel savings that you would even in a Highlander hybrid. So for most folks out there, especially if you're traveling frequently at higher highway speeds, the bigger three-row Highlander hybrid is actually going to be more efficient in a lot of driving situations than the mm -hmm. CRV hybrid. And speaking of hybrids... So how about for sedans now? We got some, how about we do, how about we look at some, someone asking about sedans? I Mid see that here. Uh, let me get my notes out here. So yeah, so uh, looking at a hybrid sedan that can handle snow and cold well. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, everybody with everybody in a snowy area seems to be so obsessed with all-wheel drive. Even if you go down to the compact segment, the inside, the Elantra and the Corolla are all front-wheel drive only. I'd probably steer with I'd probably steer into the Sonata or the Camry. I just got out of the Camry too, and the Camry, uh, you were right with the Camry. I got 53 miles per gallon out of the Camry. Yeah, the fuel economy is incredibly good in the Camry. <laughs> and if you really want all-wheel drive, you're basically left with something along the lines of the all-wheel drive Prius, which has a tiny electric motor in the back. Um, better than nothing, but not, you know, not, you know, it's not going to clear any sand dunes or, or snow drifts or anything. Um, or the Crosstrek plug-in hybrid. But the Crosstrek's fuel economy is, you know, not not huge. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and you do kill, you do lose out on cargo space because that battery does yep. get out quite a bit of it. Yep. Um, but you gain the plug. Or what's our next question here? So look at, they're looking at a Telluride or a Palisade, but they're concerned with resale value, reliability, and fuel economy. And they they're asking if their Highlander Hybrid would be a better choice. Um, to be honest, if you're looking at Hyundai and Kia and you're concerned about reliability, don't be. I, yeah, I would, this, this is a tricky one. I love the Highlander Hybrid, mind you. So the Highlander Hybrid is an excellent option, but it's not going to be as roomy. So, you know, I see you're asking about two adults, a Labrador, and one rear-facing child seat. So that should be just fine in a Highlander. Uh, if you are thinking, however, that you may want, you know, more Labradors or more child seats, then the Kia or the Hyundai might be a better option because the third row is going to be a lot more comfortable, considerably more usable mm -hmm. and more comfortable. The cargo area is also bigger. Now, on reliability, they're actually pretty close. So all the indications that we've seen so far uh, are putting the Telluride and Palisade right up there 
uh, with the Highlander in terms of reliability and generally speaking above the Honda Pilot. Um, Honda reliability hasn't been as good lately as some might hope. Um, so definitely reliability isn't a problem. Resale value is actually a little bit tricky because so far demand for Telluride especially has been extreme. So resale value has actually been really good. How that continues long term, we don't know because it will really depend on the kind of cash we see on the hood. You know, I have a video talking on the channel about resale value and why I don't really think it's a big deal, to be perfectly honest. Here's the nutshell of that video. When manufacturers talk about resale value, they're talking typically about ALG and other companies that calculate resale value, and it's always done off MSRP. So if a company sells a car for $20,000 and then after 10 years, it's worth $10,000. They'll say it has $50,000 of resale value left. Well, sure, that's fine. But what if the car MSRP for $20,000, but you actually bought it for $15,000, and then after that same time period, it was worth $7,500? Well, traditional resale value calculations would tell you that the resale value is worse because it's only worth $7,500, not $10,000. Problem is you paid less for it. So in reality, your resale value is actually the same. And unfortunately, we do not have good national statistics for price tags, average transaction prices, but we can make estimates. When you look at brands, especially the American brands and Nissan, especially because Nissan has tons of cash on the hood, that tends to drive down their resale value calculations. And this is an area where Hyundai and Kia historically have put a lot of cash on the hood. So their older resale value calculations were iffy in that same way, but they're actually headed in an upward direction because there's less cash on the hood. Um, now, the disadvantage to you as a shopper is that you're not going to get as good of a deal. Um, but if you're worried about those resale value calculations, probably not going to be very far off in reality. My bottom line, just before we move on, my bottom line there would be Pick whichever one of these three you think is a best fit for your family and is most comfortable, you like the most, et cetera, you, you feel attracted to the most. That's the one you're going to be happier with long term, because honestly, there are pros and cons to all three of these vehicles. They're all three really solid options. And I've always felt that the one that you feel more emotionally attached to, the one that you feel more comfortable with, et cetera, that's going to be the one you're going to keep longer. And in any automotive purchase, uh, the vehicle that you keep longest is going to be the one that's least expensive to own long term. Still in the crossover train, 45K, no Mercedes, BMW, or Lexus. Must be fun. Yo. Must be <laughs> fun. Uh, you know, in my head, my head immediately went to Stelvio. Uh, and I know that's going to offend some people that are like, oh my God, it's a Fiat. It's made in Italy. It's going to blow up the moment you drive it off the dealer. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I'd be talking about base Stelvio, not the ones that everybody seems to have problems with. Um, the Quadrifolio has definitely had some some issues, let's put it that way. But the base 2-liter turbo has been perfectly reliable. Um, you know, it uses an off-the-shelf 8-speed automatic from ZF, um, and it's not going to have bells and whistles and electronics to go wrong. So I would say base Stelvio rear-wheel drive is an incredible amount of fun. If you want something Japanese... Uh, with all-wheel drive, the RDX might squeak it in under 45K. Um, and I'm, I'm including these mainly because you spoke about other luxury brands. So I'm assuming you're open to other luxury brands rather than, than mainstream things. Uh, and I would probably include XC40 T5 on that list. That's a surprising amount of fun in the subcompact category. All right. You ready for a real crazy mix of cars? For 45K I saw that one. Price. Yes. Wow. 45K price. <laughs> Which one would you get? You know which. You know our choices are Stinger GT1, a loaded Charger RT, a Ridgeline, and a Forerunner Limited. I like this question, I have to say first. I like this question because this is a real person shopping, and most people tend to be in this same thing where they're like, should I get a crossover? Should I get the sports car that I want? Should I get the family sedan? Like, what should I get? And I don't know. Um, you know, I've been there myself. I think mm -hmm. that's a really rational thing. So, you know, one of the troubles, of course, when we're doing reviews on any of these cars, though, is that, you know, we're going to try and compare them within their same category. We're assuming that, you know, we're shopping Stinger against something else that's like it. And that's not always how customers shop. Um, unfortunately, when, when we're doing videos and car reviews, we have to try and, and cast the net wide. Um, but this is very, very common to be, uh, to be all over the map. Oh yeah. So which one would you pick? 
Ooh, that is a tricky one. You go first. Stinger. Easy. Stinger? Stinger. Oh, okay. So I have I have a I have a nuanced thought there. <laughs> <laughs> um, since this customer said daily commuter, I would steer away from the forerunner. That would be my first comment. Oh, yeah. um, the forerunner, I don't find very comfortable, to be perfectly honest. The technology is old in it, and the fuel economy is honestly pretty dreadful. I would probably get a Tacoma before I got a forerunner because it has the newer engine and the newer transmission. So, Hopefully the forerunner is going to get replaced sometime soon. Yes, it will be replaced soon. I believe it's 2024. Mm -hmm. That's um, the claim. Yeah, TNGAF is the new body on frame architecture. It's on the there's two wheelbase lengths, Tundra, Sequoia, and I believe LX Land Cruiser on the big, on the long, longer wheelbase one. Uh, Hilux, mm -hmm. Tacoma, Forerunner are on the smaller wheelbase yep. one, and I believe yep. it's a hybrid. So that's the yeah. plan. So you're okay. Still with, a long ways off. Oh yeah. So you're okay with, uh, you know, legs out, stretch, kind of like doing this. Uh, you I know? mean, this person <laughs> did not say how tall they were. So <laughs> if you are, you know, five eight, which is you know, as I recall, the height of the average American still somewhere in that below six foot category. Maybe it's not so bad. If you're a taller person, Tacoma's driving position is a problem, but I probably would still get it before I forerunnered. Um, mm -hmm. I like the Ridgeline. The Ridgeline's a great small truck. Um, I've said this before. It is, it is all the truck that most people need, but for some reason, not what they want. So, you know, I suspect that a, a huge percentage, not going to go with numbers here because people might crucify me later, uh, but a huge percentage of half ton truck shoppers would be just fine in a Ridgeline. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is very few people actually tow more than 5,000 pounds with any regularity. Um, and very few people ever haul size, large things or, or weights in the bed of their truck uh, that the Ridgeline could not accommodate. Um, it's, it's the rational person's truck. If you ever needed to go that next level, you can rent a truck from Home Depot. Um, mm -hmm. On the Charger RT versus Stinger, I think this one's tricky. So I would Stinger with the new 3.3 Turbo before I got the Charger RT, but you could get the Charger 392 uh, for quite a bit less than you might think. So, you know, the sticker price on it is going to be higher, obviously, than the, than the comparable Stinger. But, uh, you know, Dodge is really well known for tons of cash on the hood. So uh, I would probably get the 6.4. So a 70 plus mile EV used must be under 16K, seat four, DC fast charger. Nice to have driver assist. Uh... Yeah. See, the one tricky part here is the adaptive cruise control puts you mm -hmm. in a really limited window. So adaptive cruise control and DC fast charging in a used EV, keeping in mind that we haven't had too many EVs out there for a while. Uh, you know, the 70, 80, actually about 80%, I think, of all DC fast charging EVs are Teslas still that, that are being sold right now. And historically, if we go back last year and, and prior, that's way over 90% of all the, the EVs for Teslas. Uh, so bearing that in mind, um, I would say if you can somehow miraculously find a base model Model 3, that might be an option for you. Uh, they might be down around $20,000 now. Um, otherwise, I would say your two best bets are gonna be Leaf and Ionic. Um, you can get adaptive cruise control on a Leaf. It's been on there for a while. So you should be able to find them on the used market. Uh, ditto on the Ionic. Um, my one comment with the Leaf would be that it uses Chatamo for DC fast charging. At the very beginning of EVs in the U.S., everybody used Chatamo because it was the Japanese standard that we just imported to the U.S. It was being pushed by Nissan, by Mitsubishi, and by Kia. Uh, also, BMW had some cash in there at some point, and they pulled out. Um, unfortunately, everybody else moved on to the new, more international standard, the CCS standard, which is harmonized with Europe. And uh, so now even Nissan has been abandoning Chatamo and the new Nissan Aria will use uh, CCS instead. So the number of chargers out there and the charge speeds are going to be lower because of that older technology on Chatamo. And it does not appear that there are very many new Chatamo stations being built in the U.S. It's very, very few and all the lower powered ones. So uh, with that in mind, 
I would say if you are not going to be using DC fast charging regularly, and if you're not going to keep the vehicle, say, more than four or five years, Leaf is still going to be a good option, and it's probably going to be the least expensive option here. Um, the current generation Leaf should have no problem with 70 mile commutes. I would steer away from the first generation with a smaller battery, however, that would be a stretch for it. Um, and if you're considering possibly a new EV, you might want to take a look at a new Leaf. Um, again, with all those caveats for the DC fast charging in mind, it's probably going to get you the closest to $16,000 out the door. Um, because the Leaf is effectively going to be replaced soon with the Aria, there's a lot of cash on the hood. I just, just did a real quick search on, on my local Nissan dealer's website. And uh, if you wanted to lease one, it's about $20,000 off. Uh, off of the, the lease amortization price, which is insane. So it ends up being like a $79 a month lease with like 3,000 down uh, and 15,000 miles a year. Or if you buy one, uh, you could probably get to maybe $25,000 with incredibly long 0% financing. So, and you'd get the $7,500 tax credit on top of that mm -hmm. uh, if you qualify. So those would be my, my pointers there. All right. More crossover talk, fun crossover, 250 horsepower or more, 35K or less. Uh, my initial bundle of thoughts, I'll just breeze through them here, then we can pick them apart. Uh, over 250 is tricky. Let me start with that one. Uh, there used to be a time where we found V6s and more turbos under hoods of crossovers. And even though crossovers are big business and they're selling really well, a lot of manufacturers have suddenly decided to just pull those engines from them. So, you know, no more two liter turbo in the Equinox, for instance. Um, we do have one in the Escape, 250 horsepower, as I recall, uh, 34,000 ish starting. The CX-5 is 250 if you feed it premium, uh, $32,000 starting. The CX-30, I think, is a better buy, $30,000 starting. Same engine, smaller vehicle, more fun, I think. Uh, the Blazer V6, actually, I really like. And if you get all-wheel drive, it has a semi-torque vectoring rear axle, which is really nice. 32000 so it's surprisingly a good deal there. Um, and if you don't mind the look, and I don't find the nose terribly attractive on this one, um, we have the Kia Sportage. Um, for 240 horsepower, uh, it actually punches, I think, above its weight performance-wise, $33,000. But the front end sort of looks like you took some other Kia crossover and then shoved it into like a mixing bowl <laughs> and it got really round up front for no particular reason. Like nothing else in the Kia line looks quite like the Sportage and I'm not entirely sure why. Great to drive and the best part about driving it is that you don't have to see the front from the inside. On the list of other options, um, you know, maybe you might be able to fit a Mini in there somewhere, mm -hmm. but be careful with options because they do get really expensive really fast. Yes. Um, I looked up, it looks like the Santa Fe 2.0T is out of this price range. So that's a little, little, little spendy. Mm -hmm. Um, the Kona N, have you heard anything about pricing? Oh my gosh. Yeah. The last, last I've heard about it is that the price point is going to be under 35 grand. Okay. So that's a good possibility then. But there's a caveat though. No all wheel drive. Ah, uh, yes. There that's was a leaked, there was a leaked little, little planner thingamajig recently. Mm -hmm. Had Kona N at the very bottom, two. It has the new two liter turbo four from the, from the from the Elantra N, and eight speed DCT, but front wheel drive only. Now, given these options, which one would you actually buy? Just the ones that, with the exception of the cars that are currently not around yet. Current currently on sale. Currently, currently on sale. Currently on sale. Just with these, I'd I'd go CX five and I'd I'd go Blazer next, and then CX five with its skinny little tires. Yeah, CX-5 with skinny little tires. <laughs> <laughs> I would, um, I suspect I might Blazer instead of CX-5. And if I wanted to save the cash, I would CX-30. My complaint with the CX-5 is the, are the tires. Well, with all that out of the way, it is time to end this episode. So let us know uh, where, where can we email you questions there, Stefan? My email should be right down there. Alrighty, and uh, yep, and be sure and stay tuned because uh, we promise that these episodes will be as regular as we possibly can. <laughs> See everybody <laughs> next week.